Hi again, welcome in .NETO's 5-minute code reviews. My name is Szymon Kulec and today I would like to go through the implementation of um, pooling of value tasks in .NET 5. Probably you are familiar with the fact that .NET 5 is the great next step for .NET, which again brings all the different frameworks under one umbrella. One of the improvements that is, is being done right now is a lot of performance work that is being worked on in the .NET 5 area. One of the most interesting cases is actually a feature that you can enable or disable that is related to pulling value tasks. Probably you saw the migration from the old async await stuff related to task and probably you, you saw that some of the methods right now are, be, are being moved to value task returning implementations. So one of the underlying assumptions is that uh, really deep, 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 there needs to be some kind of allocation to actually capture both the closure and the state of your asynchronous function. If we take a look at .NET 5, as I mentioned, there is a flag which allows you to enable this kind of caching or pooling mechanism that should help you with uh, lowering the number of allocations. Again, that's a feature disabled by default. And if you want to enable it, you need to measure it, like really measure it to see how uh, what kind of impact it has on your specific case. So let's take a look at the implementation. The first step is actually to set a, a environmental variable called .NET System Threading Pool Async Value Tasks. You can either set it to true or to one. That's the, the, the flag that will enable the caching or pooling underneath. The second that you can uh, set is actually the, the pool size. So if you set this variable, uh, it will be um, applied to the pool size for the specific case. Again, the by default, the save value is like the, uh, you multiply number of processors uh, in your machine uh, times four. So that sounds like a reasonable arbitrary default value. So now we are all set. Let's assume that we have this value set so that we enable the pooling for async value tasks. Let's take a look at another class, the class that is called async value um, task method builder of T. There is a, like a void implementation, so non-generic one, but it defaults to this one. So this is much more interesting to take a look at it. If we take a look at different um, aspects of this class, if we take a, a look at different methods related to the asynchronous flow, again, we won't be diving that deep to uh, describe the, the whole idea behind, behind uh, async await. But probably you are familiar with the things like the result of a task or value task that uh, the exception can be set, etc., uh, etc. Et probably you see that there is some logic behind it that is, uh, I would say, uh, repetitive. So again, we are checking uh, whether or not the pooling is enabled. If it's enabled, we will follow one path. If it's not, uh, we will follow the regular async task method builder path. Again, we could spend much more time on describing how async await works with value tasks, but that's not the reason why we are here. So now let's take a look how the real implementation is done. At the deepest level, there is one method which actually tries to either obtain uh, a box or create one. The box again is the thing that contains your continuation and the state of the continuation. The thing that needs to be allocated to be passed between the threads, potentially between the threads, to capture the uh, continuation, the rest of your code, the state of your code, and to enable uh, running it as a continuation. So the very first step is trying to get the cache log. It's done in a really fast manner. If you are not familiar with the compare exchange method, what it does, it ensures that 
uh, value is swapped atomically. Again, with the compare part, it will try to, or sorry, maybe not try, but actually it will check whether or not value was equal zero. If it was zero, it will swap it to one. The whole method will return the value that was previously under S cache lock. So if that was zero and we succeeded replacing it with one, it will return zero. So that's the, our case that we were able to get the lock on the pool. The next part is actually trying to get the value or get the pool and check whether or not cache is available. The cache is a simple linked list. You can see that there is like the next operation in here that we are getting the box, returning it, that we are decreasing the cache size. So that's like a regular obtaining of an item from a link list. We are in, in a safe scenario of, of where the lock was obtained, so we can do it without any fancy operations. Once we retrieve the box and we know that it's not null, what we will do, we will write uh, the cache log value with zero. We need to do it with the volatile write. It will ensure that uh, the half barrier, half memory barrier will be placed in here and that once the another thread sees that there is zero in here, all the previous changes, including the obtaining the value from the linked list, will be available and visible as well. So we log the value, or sorry, we take the log with the compare exchange atomically, but we can release it in a much more friendly and relaxed way, simply using volatile write. Again, if the box was null, we will just write the cache log zero because we want to release it. And if it wasn't returned before, we will need to allocate it in here. So as you can see, if you set the mentioned variable, environmental variable at the very beginning, you will go through this path and your code will try to first take the lock and then obtain the box whenever it is required to capture the state behind a continuation for the value task. As I mentioned, this is a feature that you need to enable explicitly. And as Stephen Taupe says, uh, please measure it because again, we are betting against a really small allocation in here. So this optimization may not pay itself off. I hope that in this short video, you are able to see how the pooling or caching of the underlying value tasks objects work in .NET 5, uh, that you saw how the compare exchange is used in for locking and how the volatile write is used for uh, a relaxed version of releasing the lock. Underneath you will find some more materials, some more links for this five minute code reviews. And if you are interested in learning more about uh, async await, including the new and shiny value tasks related stuff, please visit asyncexpert.com. The link is placed underneath this video. Take care, bye.